So welcome back everybody. My name is Angus Dawson. I'm Professor of Bioethics here at the Centre for Biomedical Ethics at the National University of Singapore. And today I'm going to be talking about some of the ethical issues and values which are important when we're thinking about questions in public health. One of the things that I want to emphasize is picking up on some of the things in previous videos is thinking about how the approach to thinking about ethics reflects the idea about the important values and issues within clinical care. And some people argue that they ought to be used as the basis for exploring issues in public health as well. I want to suggest that there can be problems with that approach and that we need an alternative. A good example of somebody that argues for this view, what I'll call the standard view, is Daniel Wickler. And he argues that when it comes to thinking about issues in public health, his specific references here are to his discussion of health promotion, we ought to focus on thinking about just as we would with a clinical care, promoting individual autonomy, unless there are reasons to think there might be harm to other people. So this is a standard liberal view, which we see a lot in um, bioethics. On this view, how this relates to thinking about um, issues ab about um, um, health promotion is related to these questions to do with the, the preferences that we happen to have as individuals. The supporter of the view that Wickler, Wickler is outlining here is going to argue that the kind of preferences that we have are important to our, our identity and that it's not appropriate for other people to seek to change those preferences. However, I want to suggest that there are some reasons to raise some questions about this kind of approach and the appropriateness of using this standard liberal view, which you see a lot in relation to discussing issues in clinical ethics, when applied to issues relating to the example that I talked about last time, the correlation that there often is between different kinds of chronic disease and thinking about rates of obesity. You may remember that I showed some slides from the CDC that suggested the significant changes that happened within a relatively short period mapped across the individual states in the US. And we can ask some questions about um, starting off with this idea about the importance of individual choice ideas about autonomy and raise some questions. And here I've outlined some of the questions that, that we might seek to ask. So the first question is thinking about whether or not the US citizens that are mapped in those uh, very dramatic slides have actually chosen to become obese. And I would as assume that most of you are going to agree with me that that seems a very strange question to ask, that most people are not intending to actually adopt obesity as a particular choice in relation to their lifestyle. And we can ask some questions then about what kind of notion of autonomy is at work here. Autonomy, like many concepts in bioethics, is a contested one. And what we can see at work here is a, what we might refer to as a thin notion of autonomy, essentially one that just accepts on the face of it the kinds of choices that people make, the preferences that they happen to have at a particular moment. We are, on this approach, not thinking about true autonomy being the kinds of choices that people make as a result of critically engaging with those preferences or choices and thinking about whether or not they specifically want to um, adopt those choices as being theirs. Essentially that they are promoting their autonomy in a richer sense through the actions that they choose to take. 
Thirdly, we might think about the place of information here. So in the liberal account uh, presented by somebody like Dan Wickler, the idea is that there are limits upon the kinds of interventions that governments or departments of public health might be legitimately able to make. And one of those is providing information to people. The interesting question to think about here is, is there a lack of information about um, obesity and the association, correlation of obesity with various kinds of chronic disease? Do people lack the understanding? Do they lack the information? I'd suggest that they don't. So we can ask a question here about if people are not responsive to the information that's presented, if they're not responsive to what they know is the case, and they are, they are from choice, they would not want to become obese, we can raise some questions again about the degree to which individuals are truly autonomous in this situation. And lastly, we can raise some questions to do with the uh, causal complexity that I sketched in the previous video. You remember from the UK Foresight Report that emphasised the idea that the kinds of um, causal factors that might be relevant when we're thinking about rising rates of obesity how that can relate to all kinds of different policies, agricultural, food policies, employment policies, the nature of modern life, um, very often both partners working, less time spent on food preparation, etc., etc. There are, of course, alternatives to the approach that people like Wickler are taking here. And an alternative that I'd suggest is one that looks towards what we might call socially embedded values. So there's a whole range of issues here and we haven't got time to go into each of these uh, concepts in turn and explore again what the different alternative interpretations of these concepts might involve. But the idea is that many of these concepts are taking seriously the idea of human beings as social creatures. The idea here is that our ethical values and our ethical judgments ought to reflect that to some extent, at least when we are talking about issues in relation to, to public health. Again, thinking back to some of the issues that I outlined in the previous uh, lecture in, in discussing the, the, the content of um, the factors which suggest reasons why we might focus on the population's uh, health, not just individual health. These kinds of values here are important in relation to that particular role. So thinking about things like solidarity, community, reciprocity, these are values which we see between individuals and see embedded within a social context. They do not relate um, merely to single individuals. Ideas about the common good, how we might think about the kinds of relevant actions to take as individuals and communities as being things that are not necessarily in conflict. Of course, individuals can come into conflict with communities, but the idea is that we might look towards a unifying concept as a way to bring these socially embedded ideas together. And one concept that has been talked about a lot in relation to public health is thinking about the conditions for human flourishing. Again, note the link back here to some of those definitions of public health that we explored in the first video. Ideas about the conditions for you to flourish. So the thought might be that we can still allow for individuals to have different um, approaches to what's important in their lives, different priorities and so on. But whatever you want to pursue in your life will require a set of conditions which are likely to allow you to actually flourish. And the thought here is that flourishing is something that um, 
is going to be important when we're thinking about both healthy individuals, but also communities. We're going to um, look towards how we might engage with other people, perhaps individuals who are less able to look after themselves, look at um, issues related to justice perhaps, thinking about disadvantage, and how we can um, act together to actually improve both individual and community flourishing. So ethics is of course contentious and what I've outlined here are some of the things that we might see as being important when we're thinking about um, chronic disease. And um, when we're particularly interested in reflecting upon some of the issues that I covered in, in previous videos, thinking about the impact upon the, um, the growing impact upon um, communities and how a focus on individual autonomy is going to um, look as though it's not going to provide the kind of answers that are going to allow us to respond appropriately to the kinds of factors that I was outlining in relation to um, the, the factors that endanger population health and how we might actually approach addressing some of those. The idea of other values are going to be um, really important here, these socially embedded values, and how they might provide reasons for exploring other kinds of policies that link back to those definitions of public health, the aims for public health, remember, thinking about um, preventing or reducing harm, promoting health, and responding to inequities. And also, of course, there is the complexity of the causal story and assumptions about responsibility here in the background. We are, by adopting this more socially embedded approach, we are choosing to move away from the idea that a particular set of practices that result in a higher weight are completely within the autonomous control of the individual themselves. Yes, of course, there is an aspect to do with uh, choice. Choices are made by individuals and they have to take responsibility for those choices. But those choices are made within a social context. And that social context then relates to some of the issues that we saw in relation to the reasons to focus on a population-based approach. So thank you very much. I will stop here.